Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. Now on today's video, I have here before me two 18650 cells. One is a brand new LG HG2 18650. The other is a uh, no-name uh, hoverboard battery, which has been uh, used quite extensively and does not offer very good performance in the actual hoverboard application. Now this is the cell that I included in my new hoverboard battery video. And this particular cell is uh, extremely, extremely good. So it, uh, I, I re increased my range from three miles to, do, to a charge on these cells to about 15 miles to a charge on these cells. Now I'm outside today because I'm actually going to be tearing these cells down to investigate the inside of them. Now, as you've noticed, I've written zero volts on the outside of both of these because I have fully discharged these to zero, not to 0% state of charge, but to zero volts. Now in a lithium ion battery, discharging below uh, about 2.5 volts per cell ruins the cell. So these are entirely uh, basically ruined. However, the reason I've done this is so that I can actually cut these open with this pipe cutter and uh, be much less likely to worry about uh, a thermal event occurring. Now before I uh, take these apart, I'm gonna show you a few diagnostics and tell you what I'm gonna be looking for. Now surprisingly, the capacity overall at a very low rate of discharge was very comparable between the two. The cheap cell came in at 2.62 amp hours and the expensive th rated 3000 milliamp hour cell came in at just under 3000 at 2.821 amp hours. So 2,821 milliamp hours. Now this was very surprising to me because the actual range was not really, uh, was, was so vastly different between these. I would have thought I would see more like a thousand uh, milliamp hours here. What makes the big difference though in actual performance in a high demand application is the internal resistance of the cells. Whereas the LG HG2 is showing an internal resistance of 33 milliohms, the cheap cell actually had almost three times that. And as a result, even though they may have similar energy capacity, this one had much lower amperage output capabilities. And because of this internal resistance under high demand, it would tend to show considerably less than the full rated uh, or full discharged capacity. So even though these have similar energy, it's going to be fairly obvious, hopefully when I take these apart, that the uh, this one is of a lower quality material or for whatever reason is lower in performance than this cell. Now in certain applications or in certain uh, knockoff cells, you may actually find a smaller cell inside surrounded by filler material to make it heavy but I don't suspect that this is the case in this particular instance because the capacity is pretty good still. Instead, what I suspect would be the problem is either this is just a very uh, cheap cell made with inexpensive, low quality materials, or what I think is most likely may be that this is actually a used cell. So it, used, it was used through its full useful lifespan and uh, it just it, it got so bad in its previous application that it was taken to a recycling center or thrown away, but then it was salvaged by whoever built the hoverboard battery and uh, used as a second life in that. So for whatever reason, the internal resistance is much greater in this and the uh, internal resistance and capacity are somewhat better in this one. So what I'm going to do is take these apart and I'll show you what I'm going to be looking for. Now an 18650 is actually designed a little bit more, co uh, more complexly than some other types of battery. So if this is the top of your cell, you'll have your active material inside here, round up in a spool. And this active material consists of the, uh, an anode, foil, a cathode, foil, and a separator between them. And this separator will be soaked in an electrolyte that allows ions to pass back and forth, but doesn't allow the electrical current to flow through and short out the cell. So we're of course gonna be looking for these materials and looking at their quality. But additionally, inside every 18650, or at least every good 18650, there's a few additional components at the anode, uh, at the cap of the cell, the top side of the cell. So in addition to this, there should be a PTC thermistor And a PTC thermistor is a resistive element that increases its resistance as the temperature rises. So this is placed there as a resistive system and, uh, and a current limiting system to prevent the cell from being shorted out or over discharged. 
This is your first line of defense to protecting cells against a thermal overload. Additionally, there's going to be a, uh, a pressure relief valve, so they call this a vent, and this is an overpressure valve that will allow gases to spill out of the top of the cell through, this, through these holes on the top of the cell in the event that it becomes so incredibly uh, overpressured that it has to vent out. So both of these things seek to prevent the cell from exploding and catching fire. Uh, I suspect they will almost certainly be present in this LG cell, but I actually am not sure if we're going to see them or if we're going to see very high quality components in the no-name Chinese cell. So that's why I'm going to be taking these apart today and inspecting their inter internal construction. And in addition, of course, I also would like to see just what they look like inside. So I'm going to move on to that part of the video and we'll proceed. So I put some gloves on to protect my hands against any electrolyte or other uh, possibly hazardous materials that may come out of these cells. Now before I start the teardown process, I need to emphasize that uh, if you're going to do this, be sure and uh, do this at your own risk. I don't recommend taking batteries of any kind apart, particularly lithium batteries. And the only reason I, am, I feel fairly confident about this is because I've fully discharged these to zero volts and I'm doing this outside so if a fire breaks out, I can easily control it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the LG cell, and this will be our kind of baseline marker for how a good cell should look. And then afterwards, I'll take apart the cheap cell, and we'll see if we can spot any differences. For all I know, if this is actually a used cell, it may be almost identical inside to the LG cell. But that's what we're here to find out. So here I have a, uh, a rotary pipe cutting tool. This is generally used to cut copper pipe. And I'm actually going to enter from the uh, anode side. So I'm going to back off the cutting wheel, and uh, I'm going to—I'm guessing the thermistor and the vent are going to be in this rippled part. So I'm going to go just a little bit below that, and I'm basically just going to try to cut the top off. So we'll start cutting, and just start rotating the cell. And the idea of this type of a tool is it cuts gradually, and you just increase the depth of cut very slightly with each pass. So I've never actually opened one of these and oh, it's gotten off track. I've never opened one of these cells before so this will be a bit of a learning experience for me as well. Hopefully I've taken sufficient precautions to protect, protect it against thermal events. But uh, if it doesn't have any energy in it there shouldn't be any way for it to ignite. The chemicals in it could still be reactive however so we want to be careful about that. Oh, looks like it's starting to get there. Oh, well, our top, our anode side has come apart. We can start analyzing from this side. Here's our, uh, here's our top cap, and it looks like this little metal element is most likely our thermistor. And that thing up there is the vent. You can see inside, if I get close, you can see the vent has a uh, sort of, it has some holes and perforations and a gasket around it. And underneath this piece of fabric, it looks like that is our active material. So you see in there, we have our active, uh, those are our layers of anode cathode separated by our foil, or our uh, separator foil. Now let's see if we can just pull this out, oops, if we can just pull this out, or if we're going to have to go in from the back to release the rear end of it. I'm gonna just break this part off here. So this is very much, this is where the energy is stored. These, these layers in there are basically like the layers you'd find in a lipo, a lithium polymer cell. And you can see there's uh, the black stuff that's flaking off. That's our active material. Now, I don't know if it would naturally be that black color in its actual application. It may be because I've fully discharged this that it's discolored. I'm not entirely certain, but I don't think I would ever want to take one of these apart in a fully charged state, lest it should go critical and throw flames everywhere. So doesn't look like it's going to yield, so I think I'll do the same cut on the back side of the cell, and uh, we'll see what we can see going in from that side as well. Now one of the things I should uh, observe is the packing is very dense. There are many, many, many layers of material in there, and that is most likely what gives this cell both its low internal resistance and its high capacity. Because uh, the more layers you have and the more active material you have in the cell, the more likely it is that the cell is going to actually uh, 
it, it, it gives the electricity more path to take through the cell. And that means lower internal resistance and also more available material as, uh, as an active material. So here's the rear end of our cell. It's got a similar sort of configuration with a tab and a set, there's a bit of an insulating ring. Now, interestingly, I haven't really smelled the telltale uh, sort of bubblegum slash acetone smell that you would expect from a, uh, from a failed lithium cell. It has, the, I guess it has a slight smell to it, but uh, when they fail and the smoke comes out of them, it's usually quite pungent. So that's kind of interesting. It's not as volatile when it's not uh, catching fire. But hopefully, now that I've liberated this side, we should be able to push... Well, hopefully we can push the material through. Well, that's just taking the label off, or the, the, the sheathing. I might come back uh, in a second once I've gotten the active material out of the pack. So I found a fairly effective way to remove the outer casing. I took a pair of uh, snips and just sort of peel back the material and I can kind of peel this off sort of like peeling an apple. Uh, hopefully I can get this all of this material off so we can extract the uh, inner material for comparison with our second cell. So I'll come back in a second once I have peeled all of this material off. So I've removed all of the casing and uh, the smell of electrolyte is a bit stronger. It's a sort of pungent somewhere between alcohol wipes and uh, it's kind of a sweet smell. Now we can theoretically unravel the entire roll. So you can see this is the active material. I'm not sure whether this is the anode or the cathode, but the plastic layer between them, this is the separator. So this is the part that's really going to have the electrolytes soaked into it. Now I'm definitely glad I'm doing this outside because there is a very strong smell of electrolyte. But I have my gloves on, so I should be fairly well protected. And uh, I don't suspect this is going to catch fire since there's no stored energy in here. But just on, to be on the safe side, I am just prepared to throw this off onto the concrete if need be in the event of, a, uh, of anything igniting. But as you can see in the LG cell, there's a lot of material. I mean, we're talking at least, looks like three or so feet of material in here. And that's going to make for plenty of extra surface area, plenty of contact between the plates, and really a great, a great cell in general. You can see the, the layering of the material is uniform. Your lithium ion materials are, yeah, they're uniformly distributed on both. And your separator is all, looks like it's intact all the way along. And uh, it, it's a well integrated material, not a lot of discoloration. So now I'll set this one aside and we can open up the cheap cell and do some comparison between them. So now that we've got our LG HG2 cut open, let's go ahead and cut open our Chinese cell. Now this one, when I took it out of the pack, the plastic wrap was already coming off, but of course that has nothing to do with the quality of the inside of the cell, but it may make our job easier in that we can take this outer layer off first before dismantling the rest of it. So now what I'll do is I'll connect my uh, cutting wheel, my copper pipe cutting device here, and I'll go in about the same way I did for the HG2. Ooh, that one made a bit of a hiss when I turned it. So this one's got some pressure built up in it. That was different from the LG. So that'll be an interesting thing to observe. I wonder if this cell is... Uh, was about to go. I wonder if it was on its last legs waiting to uh, waiting to rupture. Oops. So here we go. Looks like it does also have at least in some form a uh, ventilation system. So that's that's a good sign for it. Maybe not as sophisticated as that of the uh, LG cell though. I don't see as many uh, facets of little holes dr little holes drilled in the top, but it does have the gasket and it does have the protection, so I think this is a protected cell. So it looks like it's going to be a similar story where I'm going to have to cut the back off as well to get the stuff out. So I'll return when I've done that in a minute. One thing I've noticed is it looks like the electrolyte is more mobile in this cell than in the HG2. Uh, it looks like this whole separator area is kind of wet at the top, whereas in the other one it looked more or less dry until I had completely opened it. And this one also has a significantly stronger, more pungent electrolyte smell to it as well. 
So I'll continue taking this apart and we'll see if there's any signs of discoloration uh, or other signs of failure. I can already see at the bottom, it looks like it may have gotten hot towards the center of the cell, but it's hard to say if that's not just an artifact of the uh, manufacturing process. So I got the outer casing off, and interestingly, the number three is printed over and over again on the wrapping of this cell. So it's uh, the construction is a bit different from the HG2. One thing I have noticed, though, is the inside wrapping density is just about as high as the HG2 was. Now, it looks like this is being held together with some kind of adhesive tape. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to peel that off. Well, yeah, it looks like it will. Not all of it, though. So I'll see if I can get the separator uh, loose. May have to cut this adhesive tape. And then we'll unravel this one and we'll compare the length between the two. Now the consistency is obviously not as good in here. As you can see, it's very sort of hit and miss haphazard application. And uh, I suspect this may have a lot to do with the reduced performance of the cell. Additionally, the length of cell is much less, actually. Well, actually, no. No, it's fine. It's about the same. But you can see the real limitation here looks to be that the application of uh, actual electrode material, I'll let you see all the way to the end, is much less consistent. And there it is. That's, that's all, the, all that black stuff, all that sort of powdery looking stuff is our material. And I'll see if I can hold it side by side against the LG. The LG also, the plastic feels a lot thinner and lighter, which could help a lot with the internal resistance. So let me set these out side by side and we'll compare them. So I've moved the table into the sun and I've mounted uh, both of these so they're spread out completely. And you can see the differences between these are striking. The LG cell has an extremely uniform and extremely thin layering system and you can see the uh, active material, the black stuff, has been applied uniformly to the entire cell. Now the cheap cell has a very thick, coarse separator material with what looks like some discoloration, and the active material looks to have just been sort of haphazardly sprayed or painted on. It's very thick, it's not very, uh, it's not very fine, and the separation between these is uh, just generally much thicker, and I believe that probably accounts for why the performance was not as good. Now if we actually separate these further, you can see there's a sort of copper conductive layer in between. So, uh, whereas the LG cell had that copper layer kind of integrated, this in this cell the copper layer is sort of just not completely stuck on, it's, it's kind of incorrectly bonded between the separator layers, it's got all these ripples and bumps in it. And really, generally, you can see the quality of construction of the cell is much less. Now, as to whether or not this would present a fire hazard, I really can't say. It looks like the separation is good. It looks like the cell would be relatively, uh, relatively benign in terms of actual uh, crossover. In fact, I would almost think the likelihood of a short circuit would be higher with this thinner material in the LG cell. But uh, on the other hand, this is a lower quality separator, so it could punch through more easily and uh, result in a short circuit which would start a fire. Now, it doesn't really look like uh, the PTC or vents were particularly different between the cells either. Uh, both of these you can see have the, the vents. The LG looks a little bit more sophisticated than the cheap cell, but they both are uh, protected, which is a good thing. So. Overall, it's fairly evident that the cheap knockoff cell, or the not even knockoff, just the no-name cell, is a, of an inferior quality. Uh, surprising that the capacity was comparable to this, considering how much less active material it is. Maybe that's accounted for by the thicker, more deep material than this one. But definitely lower capacity and, uh, well, not that much lower capacity, but lower uh, performance and much greater internal resistance on the cheap cell than on the much thinner, more readily uh, conductive and readily traversable by ion separator in the expensive cell. So that's basically my overview of these two cells, their internal con uh, configuration. 
and so uh, it kind of gives you a feel for if you're buying a cheap 18650 versus a high end 18650 what kind of differences you might expect to see and as a result what kind of performance differences you can expect so this is my overview of the battery teardown and comparison for 18650s hope you enjoyed and i hope you learned something Remember not to try this at home unless you take the correct precautions, and even so, I can't uh, take any liability if you do anything that causes a problem. So be careful if you're going to work on anything like this. Thanks for watching Dielectric Videos, and I will see you next time.